Jesus said he was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, in our terms, the A to the Z. Jesus was our A, the Ancient of Days, Daniel chapter 7. He was our B, the Balm of Gilead, Jeremiah chapter 8. A carpenter, Mark 6. The defender of the poor, Isaiah 11. Emmanuel, Matthew 1. Friend of sinners, Matthew 11. Good shepherd, John 10. High priest in the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 5. I am, the great I am, John 8. Judge of the living and the dead, 2 Timothy 4. King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19. Lion of Judah, Revelation 5. Man of sorrows, Isaiah 53. Nations adoration, Revelation chapter 5. Our brother, Hebrews 2. Prince of peace, Isaiah 9. Quiet rest for weariness, Matthew 11. Rock of ages, Isaiah 26. Savior of the world, John 4. Tender shoot, Proverbs 8. Vine that's true, John 15. Word made flesh, John 1. Exact representation of God, Hebrews 1. We got on in there, amen? A yoke that's easy, Matthew 11, and Zion's song, Psalm 137. Jesus, A to Z. Yet no name or title is more enduring, more exhilarating, or more compelling than the Lamb of God. Let's turn to our text in John chapter 1. In verse 29, the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. When John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. John did not know that his first cousin was the Savior of the world. Was indeed the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He, like all of us, had to have it revealed to him by water and by spirit. And when that dove came upon Jesus after his baptism, then he knew this was the Messiah, the promised Lamb of God, the divine come to earth. It's said that more books are written about Jesus than anyone that's walked the earth. Surprisingly, the person of whom is second on that list is Napoleon. Napoleon wrote this about Jesus. I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and whatever other religions the distance of infinity. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I myself have founded great empires. But upon what did these creations of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire upon love. And to this very day, millions will die for him. I have inspired multitudes with such enthusiastic devotion that they would die for me. But to do this, this was necessary that I should be visibly present with the electric influence of my look, my words, and my voice. Christ alone has succeeded in so raising the mind of man towards the unseen 
that has become insensible to the barriers of time and space. Across the chasm of 1,800 years, Jesus Christ makes a demand which is beyond all others difficult to satisfy. He asks for the human heart. He will have it entirely to himself. He demands it unconditionally. In defiance of time and space, the soul of man with all of its powers and faculties becomes an annexation to the empire of Christ. All who sincerely believe in him experience that remarkable supernatural love towards him. This phenomenon is unaccountable except for the fact that I believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. And the church said, when John the Baptist spoke that day, he had a message. Behold, the Lamb of God. We read about the next day in verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, well, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you'll see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We found the Messiah! That is the Christ! And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is rocky, is Peter. (laughs) Peter was named... Changed and his life entirely rearranged because his brother spent one day with Jesus. Christianity, if it's false, is of absolutely no importance. If it's true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. We have been inspired at the City of Angels Church with the coming of a couple. Their names are Michael and Sharon Kirshner. In the 1980s, Sharon was baptized in one of the campus ministries in the Total Commitment Movement. However, after two years, she fell away, went into the world and climbed the corporate ladder, and there in time met Michael. They got married and they they both had incredible success. Well, in the 2000s, they they lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And for some reason, of course, we know the reason, but for some reason, Michael wanted to seek out spiritual truth. And so he started going to different churches, and and Sharon got more and more uncomfortable because she never really revealed the truth. And she says, you know, we need to go to the church with the right doctrine. And so they went to the ICOC church. Well, when she got there, it wasn't quite what she remembered. But in time, she got restored. And a few months, Michael got baptized. Now, at this time, Michael rose in General Mills to be vice president of a company in General Mills. Well, time went on, and a couple years later... Someone was preaching in the pulpit, and they had some incredibly negative things to say about Portland. Can you imagine that? And Michael was sitting there, and he goes, I don't understand that. And so he Googled it. And he found all the garbage. But then he started to find that little bit of gold. And in time, they, Michael and Sharon went down to visit the new church in Phoenix. And she says, that's, that's the church, Michael, that I was baptized in. And then he says, well, we need to go to Portland then. And so they came, and their faith was increased. While they were here, Lee and I spent some good time with them, and we said, you know, obviously you're not in a position right now to start a church where you're at. You need to get someplace, get training, and we'd like to invite you to be a part of the mission team of the City of Angels Church. And Michael said, he says, well, you know, bro, that's, that's quite a challenge. I said, well, tell me about it. 
He says, I just sat down with the HR director at General Mills, and they mapped out the next 10 years for me. And basically, what they said is at the end of these next 10 years of my present capacity, I will be worth $50 million. And I said, well, Michael, how much, how precious is your soul? Six months later, Michael and Sharon had moved to the City of Angels Church. He resigned his job at General Mills. He doesn't have a job right now, but he's doing okay financially. And the Lord is blessing him. Amen, guys? Now, I got a question for you. What is it worth to you to be in a church where, behold, you see the Lamb of God? You know, every Christian movement begins so nobly. It begins with Christianity and often ends with churchianity. The early disciples morphed into Catholicism. Their message became state church, infant baptism, rituals and beads. The early reformers wanted to call people back to worshiping Jesus. These Protestant denominations, their message has sadly become buildings, programs, fun, and games. Our restoration movement, brethren, wanting to have a unification of all disciples and an elimination of denominationalism, had a bold message to return to God's Word and restore it. Interestingly, in the 1800s, it was called the Age of Enlightenment in America. And the focus was on knowledge. And so instead of the church influencing the world, the world began to influence the church. And the focus of the restoration movement began to be the knowledge of God's word. Now, we all need to know God's word. Amen, guys. But sadly, the Bible became worshipped and Bible knowledge became more treasured than the Lamb of God, than Jesus Christ. Very interestingly, in a scripture that we all know and love, in Acts 4.13, It says the followers of Christ were unschooled and ordinary men or unschooled and untrained men. The word untrained or ordinary comes from the Greek word idiote, which means idiot. So basically, the followers of Christ were unschooled idiots. I think we all qualify for that. Amen, guys. You see, the answer is not in the knowledge, but in the doing. Are you with me right here? Even in our dear Boston movement, the International Churches of Christ, the call from the campus in the early days to be totally committed was awesome. It converted many of us in this room. And yet over time, our movement morphed into a group of men and women that idolized the movement itself and the leaders within. And when it crashed, so many people's faith crashed. Because their God crashed, the movement crashed, and they didn't know what to do with that. I put before you in this conference, and in our new movement, the message needs to simply be, Behold the Lamb of God. Are you with me right here? The message needs to be Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When that message was given from John the Baptist... To the future John the Apostle and Andrew. After spending one day, they were evangelistic. Why are people evangelistic right now? They think that Jesus is moderately important. But let me tell you this. Either he's divine or he's not divine. If he does not save, if he is not the risen Christ, if he is not the Lamb of God... Then Christianity is of no importance. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But if he is the Lamb of God, it is the utmost important and is worth everything we have, everything we are, in order to follow Jesus and to get other people to follow him. Are you with me right here, church? The vision of our movement is to evangelize the world in a generation. The Lamb of God said to go into all the world and baptize the nations by making disciples. 
there are many who say the dream to evangelize the world in a generation is a good idea, but impossible. And therefore they dismiss it. But I read in my Bible that nothing is impossible for my God. And I cannot believe that God would send His Son to die for our sins as the Savior of the world and not have a plan to get every man to be able to respond to Him. Let me tell you something. If Nike can evangelize the world, if Coca-Cola can evangelize the world, if McDonald's can evangelize the world, God's church can evangelize the world. Are you with me here, church? You see, the real issue is people don't want to pay the price. Many who are in the first movement, they, their faith crashed and, and they started to doubt whether it was really worth all the sacrifices. What is our only response? Our only reasonable response to Jesus, the Lamb of God, to be a sold out disciple. To be willing to leave 50 million on the table. Let me repeat that. To leave 50 million on the table. Are you with me right here, guys? Now let me give a stern warning here. Our movement is not about being anti-ICOC. Those are our dear brothers. Now on the other hand... We're not going to stand by and let things go in a direction with our brothers and sisters that we don't believe the Bible says anything about. To remain silent at a time like that would be sin. But our message, and I need to be clear about this, our message is Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Are you with me right here? You see, I think we understand that many of us have been disfellowshipped. Because of our stands here. Hey, I was disfellowshipped in the 70s because I was baptized in the Crossroads Church. I was disfellowshipped in 1987 by planting a new church in Atlanta by the Crossroads Church. And now I've been disfellowshipped from even some of my ICOC brothers. And I got them into my flesh. It ticks me off a little bit. But what's Jesus say? He says, turn the other cheek. And then turn it again. And you say, well, why? Because we want them to join us. I, I am unapologetic about the fact that the Spirit has initiated a movement that now is beginning to sweep the world. And I'm unapologetic about inviting anyone, anywhere, to be a part of it. And I refuse, I absolutely refuse to draw a line of fellowship that God has not drawn. Last, uh, thank you. Last fall, when we uh, officially said, listen, it's just time to start again. Discipling is being opposed. Lukewarmness is all pervasive. We're being opposed any place we try to help and re-implement discipling, which is the only way to save the world. One of my saddest moments was going down to Santiago, Chile, and there having a son in the faith and a daughter in the faith, Raul and Linda Mourinho, say, Brother, we just don't believe what you're doing is right. Therefore, we've got to not only cut our relationship with you as discipling this church, which you've done for the last two years, and we're appreciative of all the people baptized, but we cannot have fellowship with you. Whoa. Elaine and I, we stayed for Thanksgiving dinner the next night because <laughs> the plane didn't leave till the next morning after that. <laughs> and... Never a word was heard for many months. Unbeknownst to me, Raul was reading the website every week. And about three weeks ago, I get this phone call. 
He goes, bro. I go, yeah. He says, bro, this is Raul. He says, Raul who? <laughs> Raul Moreno, you're down in Santiago. Remember you were discipling me? He says, I don't know where to begin, but you were right about everything. He says, that article, that article haunted me, that one about fellowship or movement. I was haunted by those scriptures. And bro, I am now willing, if you'll take us back, we are willing to stand by your side, take whatever abuse, whatever disfellowship, and whatever punishment comes away. I don't know how many people are going to follow us here in Santiago, but we want to begin the Santiago International Christian Church. And they had their first meeting on Thursday night. Our message is, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And we will evangelize the world in this generation through Jesus' plan of discipling by our response of being sold out disciples. And we will pay any price, be it $50 million or the fellowship of anybody, as long as we please our Savior in heaven. Because we believe that those who love the Lord, given time, given study, given a chance, many of them, not all, but many of them will join us in our great crusade to evangelize the world in this generation. Are you with me right here? I have three points. Number one, the blood of the Lamb makes a distinction. Number two, the blood of the Lamb is our motivation. And number three, the blood of the Lamb sets our final destination. I will call upon your Bible knowledge to remember with me back in the time of Moses in the book of Exodus. We remember the ten plagues, the blood, the frogs, the gnats, the flies, the livestock, the boils. The hail, the lokeness, the darkness that could be felt. And then the death of the firstborn. Turn to Exodus chapter 11. In Exodus chapter 11 verse 4 we read, So Moses said, This is what the Lord says, About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her handmill, and to all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But amongst the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any man or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. If you go back to each one of the plagues, the Lord made a distinction. When it was dark in Egypt, it was light. Amongst the Israelites. In chapter 12, we continue. In verse 12. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. God never wanted them to forget that he had sent his death angel over them. And they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. And every year he wanted them to celebrate a festival to remember what he had done. The blood of the Lamb makes a distinction. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's my conviction that for those that only stay in the New Testament, you miss the richness of the Old Testament. But not only that, you often miss the real meaning of the passages. The reason the New Testament is so short is there's so much in the Old Testament that it builds upon. And I'm convinced we're not just out to build a New Testament church, we're out to build a Bible church. Now, 1 Corinthians 5, we have a very interesting passage that I think is very apropos for our day. Verse 1. 
It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And of a kind that does not even occur amongst pagans. A man has his father's wife. Wow. You imagine that? In the church. There's this guy shacking up with his father's wife. Now look at this. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather be filled with grief and to put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. And I've already passed the judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I'm with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. He says you've got to deal with sin. Verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Now, what were they boasting about? They were boasting about their tolerance. We love this guy so much. We're so patient. And they confused a person in one of the most gross sins of immorality with being a weak Christian. And their boasting was in this tolerance in the name of love. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? He says, don't you understand that if you let a little sin come into the church, it's going to work through the whole dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. He refers back to that passage about the death angel passing over and saving the people because of the blood of the lamb. And he says, out of respect for the Passover lamb, celebrate the festival. The festival was the coming together. How can you celebrate the festival? All the disciples need to be pure and clean. If you let a little batch of sin on in, it'll go through the whole dough. If you don't deal with sin, it goes through the whole church and the festival is gone. Look what he says on down. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all mean the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. That's the truth. Amen, guys. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. What such a man do not even eat? What business of a mind to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Got to judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Paul was hard lying. He loved that sinner. But he loved God's church. And he says, you've got to deal with sin. One of the sins that's crept into God's church and been mistaken for weakness is lukewarmness. As a matter of fact, the Bible distinguishes those two qualities in the book of Revelation. The church of Philadelphia is commended to be strong, even though it was weak. But the church in Laodicea is rebuked and called to repent because it was lukewarm. Do not confuse lukewarmness with weakness. Let's go over to Revelation 3. Most of you know that my background was in the Methodist church. And when I was 15, I started going to church where they had a bunch of college students come to our church. And it was a fundamental Methodist church. And they had this night where they had an altar call. And I responded and I I told them I wanted to become a Christian. I was taken behind uh, the stage and I was showing Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 as the way to become a Christian, to pray Jesus into my heart. And I suppose that because it was a false doctrine that was taught to me, I kind of stayed away from Revelation 3.20. Though we all need to believe Revelation 3.20, amen? And we are the first to teach that, obviously, this is a praying Jesus your heart. This is addressed to the church. This is addressed to people who are already baptized disciples. Are you with me right here? But I want you to read this for me. He's just called the church to repent. And in verse 20, Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. 
that the denominational world has something on right that we don't. The denominational world is saying, hey, look at this passage. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and he wants in. And of course, they teach the false doctrine of praying Jesus in. But they, they teach something we don't. This passage visual that is given by Jesus is of a church where Jesus is outside of the church. Have you ever been to a lukewarm church? Maybe you yourself have been lukewarm. And there is a definite sense that the Spirit is not there. You see, right here, the passage is teaching that in a lukewarm church, Jesus has left the building. Now he's knocking. He wants back in. But Jesus has left the building. See, that's why so many in our fellowship, and it's so sad, are now not just going to, to mainline churches, but they're going to denominational churches saying, well, we know the doctrine's not right, but at least there's some spirit. And it becomes the excuse for worshiping in a church that propagates false doctrine on salvation. Now, I've got to ask you something. Has Jesus left your building? Do you sense the spirit inside of you? Is that spirit stirred every morning when you get on up? Do you feel the fire of the spirit inside of your soul when you read those scriptures? Do you get up with passion? Do you get up with a sense of, I cannot wait to be with my Lord and Savior? He is the most important thing in my life. Not a half an hour of extra sleep. Maybe some of you are visiting. And you're in a lukewarm church. You know something? If you're not a leader in that church, there's no way you're going to turn it around. And some of you are in churches where leaders have now for year after year after year. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And Jesus is still not in the building. It's time for you... To decide whether or not you're going to leave the 50 million on the table and find yourself a fellowship where Jesus and His Spirit are there propagating that church into all the world for the message, the saving message of, Behold, the Lamb of God. What stops a church from this yeast of lukewarmness? The confession of sin. When was the last time you confessed your sins? But here's the real problem. Is that in the church, we always think it's, oh well, I'll wait for this brother to convince his sins. I'll wait for this sister. No, no. We need to love them. We need to be in discipling relationships. We go, bro, it's been a while since we've just really gotten down to it. How's it coming on the internet? How, how are we really doing Sis, how are your husband really doing? You, you guys. How's the drinking going? How's the relationship with the kids going? See, we have a responsibility, and I, this is unpopular, but let me be clear. Let me be very clear. We have a responsibility that in love and mercy to judge our brother. Not, not with the hypocritical judgment. Jesus said, hey, you know, it'd be stupid, you know, to look at the guy with a little speck in his eye when you got a two by four hanging out of yours. Say, hey, bud, you got a speck in your eye. But he does say, once you get the two by four out of your eye, then take the speck out. See, we allow lukewarmness because we don't challenge our brothers. We're afraid of criticism. We're afraid of people looking down on us. We're afraid of looking weird. We're afraid of losing friends. That's not what being a Christian is about. But being a Christian about being sold out for Jesus and caring enough for our brother to say, bro, I'm concerned about where you're at spiritually. You've been around the church for years and you're still not coming to Bible talk leaders meetings. There's something. There's something wrong here. By this time, you ought to be a teacher. But you're still being fed milk.
A church that's a zealous church. A church that's on fire with the Spirit is a loving church. You know, the 42 disciples the Holy Spirit sent down to Los Angeles, God has used powerfully. We celebrated our inaugural service May 6th. It's officially now three months later. In the first three months, God has added to our number 18 people being baptized. Is that awesome? And tonight, Gabe Morello is going to be baptized. That'll be our 19th baptism. As amazing as that is, here's even something more amazing. 29 people have been restored in the first three months. I know pretty much all the history of the church plantings in the ICOC movement. There has never been such a thing done. There have been 41 people placed membership that were either in the ICOC in the mainline church or in denominational churches. Yeah, they were weak. They were struggling, but they still had that little connection. The Lord has a lot of mercy, doesn't he? So the Lord connection, we said, okay, come on in. We need to study a little bit here. Get you fixed up. Get you sold out. And then you'll be part of the fellowship. Amen, guys? Now, you know, what's, what, what, one of the reasons I, I know the Holy Spirit called Elena and myself to go back to L.A. was that over the past five years, there have been 6,000 people that have either fallen away from the old L.A. church or walked away. 6,000. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see God work. You know, a couple that Elaine and I just so appreciate and admire are Rob and Burgundy on Achaia. This is, this is a powerful couple. I mean, he's a producer. She's a top executive for the Cancer Society. And... Uh, they, they were sensing some major challenges with their 15-year-old son, Darian. And there's nothing like seeing problems in your kid that'll scare you back to church. And they heard about the great things that were happening with Joe Santos over in Honolulu, Hawaii. And, and, and Joe said, you got to check out the City of Angels Church. They came. They dragged Darian. Two weeks later, Rob and Burgundy were restored to the Lord. And two weeks after that, Darian was baptized in Christ. Is that awesome? I, I, I appreciate so many other families that have come. Jack and Jeannie McGee from Florida. Jack was getting up there about 57, 58. He visited here and I said, dude, you got time for one more adventure. I, I didn't know Jack and Jeannie. I said, hey, you've got to come City of Angels mission team. It's going to be awesome. He just lit up. He goes, yeah, I need an adventure. <laughs> and then you can see just Jeannie like this on the other side. You know, when they were restored, she said, I really appreciate that mountain-moving faith that my husband had. Because I was his mountain. How many spouses are mountains to their other spouse from being sold out disciples? After Jack and Jeannie placed membership and were restored, the cost for them was, in their mind, having to leave their two sons and married daughter behind in Florida. To their surprise, the two sons came, and one month after they were restored, their 21-year-old son, Jared, was baptized into Christ. You see, when you get the sin out of your life, you let the Spirit in. See, you know, one of the things that, that just is over and over again said when people come into the city of Angels is, this is the church I was baptized in. And we are unapologetic to invite people to come on in. Not that we think that if they're going to another ICOC church or mainline church that they're lost. That's not what we're about. But we're all, all about gathering a movement. And we know the more that are with us, the more workers we have to evangelize the world. And you know, when John the Baptist was was, was doubting the divinity of Christ there in prison, he sent two of his disciples to talk to Jesus and say, are you the one? And Jesus says, hey, the blind see, 
the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Good news is preached to the poor. Go back and tell John what you see and what you hear. There are some that have even labeled us satanic. And yet I say, come and see. Come and see what's done. I just can't believe that 19 people are sold out disciples and that's the work of Satan. I can't believe an unprecedented number of 29 disciples have come back home to God. And this is of Satan. I can't believe that 41 good thinking disciples have joined up to the radical city of angels church that may cost them disfellowshipment. And it's of Satan. See, I'm convinced there's got to be a distinction. You know what I think? I think a lot of our churches out there would not be able to baptize you right now. It took a powerful fellowship to attract you. A church where you just, you heard that singing. Whoa! That love. You go, man, I've never seen anything like this. It's a little unnerving being hugged, but it's awesome. If that church does not repent of lukewarmness and you stay there, you'll become lukewarm because it'll work through the whole batch. Our churches are to be distinctive from Egypt. Our churches should be a festival every time we come together. Because we are so fired up about the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. Secondly, the blood of the Lamb is our motivation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of my favorite passages, Paul talks about the gospel, about Jesus Christ dying and being raised on the third day. And then he says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, don't even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Right here, Paul is preaching the gospel, that Jesus Christ died and was buried and was resurrected. And he says, I know I don't deserve to be called an apostle. I mean, I killed Christians. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. But here's one thing, guys. I worked harder than all the rest. Who is all the rest? The other apostles. This was not an idle boast. Paul understood something that was something we've got to grasp. How hard we work. How hard we strive to save souls. How hard we help to win the weak. How hard we go out and help the poor is directly proportional to how much we appreciate the grace of God. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. We are in a battle for souls. It is a war. This war is talked about in verses 7 through 9. It is a war against Satan who leads the whole world astray. And then it says in a great promise in verse 11, talking about the Christians. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as the strength from death. There was a call that went out into our former fellowship. Hey, if we just stress grace more, then there'll be so many more people come to Christ. Well, you know, I'm the first to admit we did not stress grace enough. And we need to behold the Lamb of God. But my Bible says to me that to overcome Satan takes more than just the blood of the Lamb. It takes the blood of the Lamb first because without that, it doesn't mean anything. But then we overcome by the word of our testimony, sharing our faith. Maybe that's why a lot of us aren't living victorious lives. When was the last time you had someone to church? How many studies were in you this week? And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Yes, you have to stretch your schedule. 
This is the price the early Christians paid. Perhaps the Christian that had the greatest challenge was our brother Paul. And we read in his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Most think that Paul was baptized, became a disciple in about 37 A.D. The book of 2 Timothy was most likely written in late 66 A.D. And of course it's well documented that Paul died in 67 A.D. He was a disciple for 40 years. You know, it's kind of cool. Just two days ago, Elena celebrated her 34th spiritual birthday. I'm at, I'm at 35 right there. And you know, it's kind of a funny thing that's, that's going on in our fellowship. We, we kind of think that, well, the more mature you get, the easier it is to be a Christian. You know something? That is stupid. I know we have a lot of runners in, in, in the crowd right here in Portland. And I can tell which ones are not runners, but... You, you know, you've seen the movies. You wear the Nike shoes. And, you know, if you're running a marathon, and that's what the Bible equates to the Christian life. You know, the first couple of miles, baby Christian territory, it's tough. But it's not near as tough as mile 10. Mile 17. Mile 20. Boom! The wall! And, and it's, it's throwing off a lot of disciples to think that as they've matured, that somehow their Christianity is, is somehow harder. You need to go run a marathon. Because then you'll understand that, that the older you get in the faith, the more Satan's going to come after you. Don't be surprised at his attacks. Don't be surprised at his attacks. But look at what Paul says. Verse 6, chapter 4. He's writing this from his cell in Rome. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time has come for my departure. I have fought the good faith. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. You know, for us Gentiles, we kind of go right on over this thing. But for a Jew, whoa. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. Turn to Numbers chapter 28. In Numbers chapter 28 and 29, the phrase drink offering is used 27 times. Let me just give a quick excerpt right here of the daily offerings. Verse 6, chapter 28. This is the regular burnt offering instituted at Mount Sinai as a pleasing aroma, an offering made for the Lord by fire. The accompanying drink offering to be as a quarter hen of fermented drink with each lamb. Pour out the drink offering to the Lord of the sanctuary. Prepare the second lamb at twilight along with the same kind of grain offering and drink offering that you are preparing in the morning. This is an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. You see... Paul was, was saying much more, my time is covered by departure, I'm being poured out. Yeah, the concept is there of being poured out. And we need to be poured out, do we not? But you miss the, the analogy of a drink offering. Every day, there was to be a lamb that was slain. That was to be put over the altar. And as it was being sacrificed, the drink offering of the very best wine that the Jews had was poured over to it. And the Bible says this was an aroma that was pleasing to God. Do you want to please God? Then you accompany the sacrifice of the lamb by pouring out your best for Jesus. Too many of us save our best hours for something less important than Jesus. So many of us save our best efforts for something far less important than Jesus. As a matter of fact, we are bound to determine we don't want to be exhausted. And yet I tell you, there's nothing that will give you more peace at night than having been poured out all day for Jesus. And the Bible says that God grants sleep to those he loves. And when you pour yourself out for Jesus, 
you're going to sleep real good. I hope you sleep well tonight. You know, sadly, too many of us fall into Hebrews chapter 12, chapter 2. In Hebrews 2, it says in verse 1, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Many Christians in the first century drifted away in their early commitment to Christ. It wasn't something they just did that. It was a slow drift away. You know, we are in a war. I think it's hurt a lot of Christians that they've seen many of their leaders get wounded, quit the ministry, or get wounded and then die. They fall away. Because our faith was in our leader. Let me tell you something. Your faith is not in a human leader. Our leader for this movement is Jesus Christ. One of the great things that's, that is exciting, that's begun to happen in the City of Angels churches, is a phenomenon that, that I've not seen. We have seen so many fallen heroes that have fallen away be restored. Steve and Jeannie Bolin, they led the Victorville sector of the L.A. church. They got restored three months ago. Rodney Workman led the Irvine College ministry. He got restored two months ago. Albert Wagers was an intern in the AMS. He got restored two months ago. I talked about Rob and Burgundy on Ikea. They led the AMS in Honolulu, Hawaii. And then Mike Underhill got restored. You talk about a miracle. You know, the Underhills, came, they, they came to a jubilee. Or actually, Lance came to a jubilee a couple of years ago. And when he came to jubilee, he was all juiced up. He goes, man, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to move. And then he went back home and talked to Connie. And she goes, absolutely not. That makes no financial sense. Three months later, their, their youngest son, Joey, said, I don't want to go to church anymore. Lance calls up. He says, hey, Kip, we're coming. See, there are some things far more important than your finances. They came. Joey came to church the very first Sunday, got with it in the Lord. One month later, he met someone in high school, Josh Smith, who got baptized. In time... The Underhills got their, their daughter and the son-in-law, Jason, to move here and become part of the fellowship. And they're also down in Los Angeles. But one of the reasons that the Underhills wanted to be on the City of Angels mission team was to go get their number one son, Mike Underhill. Now, from a worldly point of view, it didn't look like this was going to be easy. He was a bartender. And he lived with his girlfriend. And you go... Oh, man, I don't know if this is possible. But with God, all things are possible. Yeah. One month later, Mike was restored in Jesus Christ. Not only that, but he is now our teen ministry leader. Amen, church? See, you can change radically. Not only, not only are there droves of, of fallen away people that, that were in leadership in the ministry, but we've got so many other leaders that were fallen and wounded. I mean, guys that have kind of grabbed the, the Portland dream where the young men see visions and your old men dream dreams. You know, following the footsteps of Tony and Bob and, of course, Jay and Matt and Vic Senior, of course. But first and foremost on the list are Marty and Kathy Wooten. They were in a little mainline church, and, I, and I, I, I reached out to Marty, and I said, bro, are you teaching there? Nah, they won't let me. I said, well, bro, I'll let you teach in our church. I said, well, you know, bro, it, you know, it may cost you. He says, I've been doing a lot of thinking. He said, I want you to know, bro, one of my best friends is Henry Crete. Hey, that's good. Maybe we can get him to join us, too. We're just, we're unapologetic about asking people to, to join us. We know that some won't, but we just want as many as possible come join us. We're having a blast. We're having a festival. We're excited about Sal and Patricia Velasco, who were evangelists and women's ministry leader in the Latin ministry in South Central. Ron Harding, who used to be the singles ministry leader in Orange County. And then a couple we've really fallen in love with, Carlos and Lucy Mejia. 
he was just floating around church to church, church to church. He was an evangelist. And she's a woman's ministry leader in the AMS. Now he's a sold out disciple leading his Bible talk. And then Ken and Liliana Zindler moved all the way from Florida to be with us. And then most inspirationally, Lou Jack and Kathy Martinez said, listen, we want to be a part of your fellowship. Now, Luis had sinned out of the ministry. Some bad sins. But, you know, I believe the Lord forgives everything. And Luis, you know, Luis is one of these very affable guys. Loves everyone, wants everyone to love him. Maybe you can relate. And so he was kind of playing the card. Oh, I'll be friends to Kip and them, and I'll be friends on over here. And wasn't getting any discipling. His wife was hurting. One night, they had a bump. Or as Kathy put it, a fight. And she said, tomorrow's my birthday. Take me to Kip and Elena's church. <laughs> Louise took her. They cried the whole service. Two weeks later, they, were, they placed membership. And as Kathy says, she was restored. <laughs> and, and what's awesome is to see them be on fire. They are totally on fire for God. Their efforts to reach out to either fallen away Christians, like Samir and Lordy in Palm Springs has produced a Bible talk, or struggling Christians, two couples that are up in Bakersfield, have produced another Bible talk. They were the ones that got the Mejias. Another Bible talk starting in Sun Valley. They reached out to Kathy's parents, and we restored them. And there's going to be another Bible talk in Rancho Cucamonga. And, of course, they have a Bible talk in their home in Whittier. And that's all been done in less than three months. You see, we believe in the God of second chances. The blood of the Lamb is our motivation. Amen? Amen. Just this past two weeks, we restored Louise and Kathy to the office of evangelist and women's ministry leader. Now, we're not paying them anything, but they get to wear the title. Amen, guys? And I wrote this to Louise in his Bible. I said, to my dear son in the faith, Louise, remember always, failure is never final unless one makes it so. Our Heavenly Father is a God of second chances because of His unfailing grace and abounding mercy. Remember, it was on the second attempt to enter the promised land that the Israelites were successful. Remember, it was on the second temple that God said would be more glorious than the first. Remember, it was the second touch of Jesus that healed the blind man of Bethesda. Remember, the second coming of Jesus will be more awe-inspiring than the first. Today begins your second coming to your God-given destiny to serve as evangelists in the kingdom of God. My prayer is that like Peter, though Satan is sifting you like wheat, you will strengthen your brothers and together we will evangelize the world in our day. Let me tell you something. There is no sin that you have committed inside the kingdom. There is no failure that you've done that Jesus will not forgive and give you a second chance. Give Jesus a second chance and give him your heart. And let that be the motivation for living the rest of your life. And this second time around in trying to evangelize in the world in our day, we will get the job done. Are you with me here, church? Turn to the book of Revelation for our close. The blood of the Lamb sets our final destination. We find that Revelation is written in a time of great persecution in the church. Written in the late 90s A.D. And yet it's so sad today that so few of our churches are persecuted. There's nothing to persecute them about. We recently got an email that said, hey... Reveal has almost totally stopped bashing the ICOC. But now they've got a lot more material because they got the Portland church. You know, I'm glad we're helping out so many people around the world. (laughs) You know, I had a very sad conversation about a year ago with people that were once dear friends. And we sat down at the breakfast table. And his words at the close of a very short breakfast. He looked at me, practically with tears. He says, Kip, I never thought it would end this way. I'm out of the ministry. 
our churches are divided. We're on different sides. Our churches have no baptisms. Our kids are falling away. I'm just really wondering, and I'm just so weary, was it worth it? I think a lot of people have thought, I never thought it would end this way. And I sat there, and I just looked him in the eye. I said, it's not the end yet. You know, the most awesome movies, it's always darkest before the dawn. And granted, it's been pretty dark. But we're going to make a cranking movie. It's going to be awesome. Because God believes in happy endings. In Revelation chapter 4, the church needed encouragement at that dark hour. I'm sure you know the scripture. We find the triune God sitting on his throne. Flashes of lightning, rumbles of thunder come from the throne. Just like on Mount Sinai. There's a rainbow around the throne reminding the disciples that John is conveying this vision to the church. He says, just hold on. It's worth it. He says, God is on his throne. He's just as powerful as he was on Mount Sinai. There's the promise of the rainbow. The four living creatures are singing holy, holy, holy. One with the face of a lion. One with the face of an ox. One with the face of a human. One with the face of the eagle. For the people at that time, that represented all living creatures. The lion, wild animals. The ox, domestic animals. Humans represented humans. And the eagle represented the birds. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on the earth or under an earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, representing the Holy Spirit, sent out into all the earth. World evangelism. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken to the four living creatures, the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them into be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands among ten thousands. They encircled the throne, the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And the church said, Only the Lamb of God could open the scroll of salvation. Right here he says he died. He purchased man with his blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. That sounds like world evangelism to me. Sounds like they got the job done. You know, I'm so excited that even now, just ten months into our new movement, that I believe the Holy Spirit is working through. It's so exciting. We've got twelve churches scattered throughout the United States preaching the message, Behold the Lamb. Preaching the message that the world can be evangelized in our day. Preaching the message that everyone is called to be a sold out disciple. Then, equally exciting, we now have a new church in the Caribbean. Curacao has stepped up. And the old ICOC church has become the Curacao International Christian Church. In Central America, the San Pedro Sula Church, led by Bananias, are cranking. In South America, Raul and Linda and Santiago are cranking. 
I mean, so we got a base in the Caribbean, a base in Central America, a base in South America, in Australia, in Brisbane. Joe Willis is still preaching the word. Amen. He's with us. In Asia, the Mumbai India Church is with us preaching the word. And we got another email just recently about another group seeking to join with us. In Africa, the brothers and sisters of the Republic of Congo and Kinshasa are preaching the word. In Europe, there's Kiev, there's Tallinn, and there's London that are preaching the word at this hour. You know something? I don't think it's going to end in a bad way. He gives us the vision of heaven. I have a little extra to add. You see, all around that cosmic worship centered on the Lamb were the saved. And I kind of see in my mind's eye an older couple just kind of limping on the clouds. Stephen Lisa Johnson. And I must say this. I don't think that we're going to be fellowshipping on different clouds up there. I don't think that autonomy is going to be the rule of the kingdom. But what's going to be awesome is that Steve and Lisa aren't going to be alone. They're going to be thousands from Portland, Eugene, Bend, Lincoln City. But there's also going to be several old friends from the mainline church, like Hank. And there are going to be a lot of friends that didn't come over to us from the ICOC. People that they, they labored for in New York and throughout Africa. And then there's going to be another hobbling couple, Chris and Teresa Vroom. Because they were converted by Steve and Lisa in their ministry. And with them are thousands upon thousands from the Midwest. Then I see kind of a, a thin, bald guy with a beautiful wife. It's DJ. And he's got, he's got thousand more disciples from New York that are meeting the old disciples from New York. And they're unified because they're beholding the Lamb. Then there's this real chubby guy. Once more with a beautiful wife. With ten kids, it's Vic Jr. And with him are thousands upon thousands of Mexicans. Yes, they're going to be Mexicans in heaven. Because of the great leadership there of that Mexico City church. But you know, my vision of heaven includes something that has offered me pain with all these thousands of friends and dear brothers and sisters that even perhaps even now we don't talk. My vision of heaven includes Elena and my three kids. I've got to build a church whose head is Jesus. That's a light to the world. And his hallmark is love. Because I want my kids to be saved. If many of the churches that we are from could no longer convert us, can they convert our kids? That's why we have a new movement. We're done waiting. It's time to evangelize the world. And behold the Lamb. Twenty centuries have come and gone. And today, Jesus is the central figure of the human race. 
All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth or as powerfully as that one single solitary life. Behold the Lamb of God.